Bookseller Crow on the Box, Tales from an Empty Bookshop. Right, let's go. Uh, okay, so good evening everyone and welcome to the latest Bookseller Crow on the Box, the, which is the latest in our filmed literary events caught on camera in, tonight in collaboration with Faber. Uh, as you'll see, I'm not at the bookshop myself, but I'm at home with my cacti collection, which you can't see, I don't know why I'm looking at it, but my cacti collection and um, my cardboard cat. Um, so, um, but tonight we have a real treat for you because we have not one, but two authors with their debut fiction novels, uh, both proudly published by Faber. We have Una Mannion with her novel, A Crooked Tree. Hello, Una. And um, we have Rebecca Watson with her novel, Little Scratch. Hello, Rebecca. Hello. And these are the two amazing books we'll be talking about tonight. So first up, I'll um, just do some introductions. Una Mannion was born in Philadelphia and lives in County Sligo, Ireland. She's won numerous prizes for her work, including the Hennessy Emerging, Emerging uh, Poetry Award and the Doolin, Kurt, Allingham and Ambit Short Story Prizes. Her work has been published in the Irish Times, The Lonely Crowd, Cranog, and Bear Fiction. And she edits The Cormorant, a broadsheet of prose and poetry. And, um, I'm just going to read out some praise for a, crook a crooked tree. Lucy Cordwell um, said this of it, reminiscent of Joyce Carol Oates, the crooked, a crooked tree is an assured and atmospheric debut, immaculately plotted with a sense of danger seeping from every shadow. The fraught relationships between mothers and daughters, sisters, best friends and crushes are captured deftly, as is the ominous sense that losing your balance on the twisting pathway from adolescence to young adulthood for even just one moment could have fatal consequences. A thoroughly gripping read. And I would totally agree with Lucy. Um, I loved it. Um, I loved the uh, narrator Libby, um, a brilliantly authentic and interesting young narrator. And um, yes, we shall talk a little bit more about your book in a moment. I'm just going to introduce our other fine guest, Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca Watson is a freelance arts writer and has been published in The Guardian, The Times Literary Supplement and Granter, among others. She graduated from the University of Oxford in 2016 and now works as the assistant arts editor at the Financial Times. And in 2018, she was shortlisted for the White Review Short Story Prize. Little Scratch is her first novel. And Little Scratch tells the story of a day in the life of an unnamed woman living in a lowercase world of demarcated fridge shelves and office politics, clock watching and WhatsApp notifications. Underneath this monotony, there's something else going on something under her skin. In a voice that is at once fierce, profound and delicate, she relays what it's like to travel that single trajectory from morning to night. At every minute along the way, ideas about sex, violence, survival and comedy intertwine. I agree with that very much. And um, uh, Olivia Suj uh, said of it, witty, defiant, tender, what a book. Um, <laughs> and I would also agree with that. Um, the collage effect of the writing at times had my heart racing and I identified with the character's thoughts um, and um, how things were scratching beneath the surface um, throughout the book. It was um, both, both books, just brilliant reads. So congratulations on your debut novels. You must be both feeling pretty proud at the moment. <laughs> Feels good, yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, so um, I'm going to just start with you, Rebecca, if you don't mind, Una. 
Um, and mm -hmm. then um, I'm going to um, just ask a few questions and then perhaps you'd like to share a bit of a reading with us. Um, so the book is set in one day um, and there's a really pleasing restraint to this time frame. Um, did you start out with this idea of time um, being that particular frame? Were you inspired by another, you know, the various other novels that have, have been taken place in one day? Um, not initially. So it, it kind of began um, just from uh, wanting to write a moment of really just like a moment of immediacy. I wanted to just capture like present tense for a second, not second literally, but, you know, like what would this kind of feel like to um, just see this woman struggling to, you know, think up of something whilst also you know, maintaining all the other kind of illusions of just existing in a moment. Um, and that became the short story that was shortlisted for that prize. Um, but once I'd finished writing it, I very quickly realized that those boundaries could be pushed more and I kind of felt like I hadn't finished. I felt like I completed like a kind of unit rather than like, oh, story tick done. Um, and so I kind of started pushing at the edges and as I started pushing quite quickly, I felt like a day would be a kind of neater structure. I felt like there would be a limit where being inside this person's head would be too much. Um, mm -hmm. And felt like a day was the kind of maximum before the reader would feel too claustrophobic or I don't know almost, almost like it was too voyeuristic to, to be in someone's head for, for longer than you know wake up for the sleep um, and it gave me this it gave me a very neat structure it was it was kind of an amazing thing to decide quite early on because then I had my plot in a way because because the book's quite plotless having okay I begin here and I end here was you know really like yeah like a life-saving writing thing that I just randomly decided um and it felt like there was so much to play on in having that kind of very neat very contained moment of time um and the books become so much about like what it is to experience time to, to live in time when you know it's it becomes a difficult thing to do mm -hmm. um yeah so it was it was a very kind of satisfying contained structure mm. I I totally agree I found the the knowledge that when the day ended the book would end reassuring but also sort of um uh yeah it just felt like i knew i was going to be able to leave this <laughs> woman but i was it added to the excitement of getting to the end because you didn't know how the day was going to end um and you also you know you really you realize that you're there's multiple uh strands going on which as you're reading you're reading down the page you're read because there, there's sometimes there's three things happening at once on the page which i found so clever um that it how it was set out and, and typeset but also how easy it was to um read like that it just became a very natural way to read and i didn't think that would happen so i was <laughs> i absolutely loved that and the sort of fragmentary nature of the thoughts flitting and the tension building uh, to do with um, the central uh, story, I suppose, or the, the part, the, the story that remains in the past that is pushing up through, mm -hmm. through the skin. Um, it, it, it worked tremendously well. Um, it's made, it, a lot of it is set in an office, um, which I loved. I was trying to think of, a film that is completely set in an office that it reminded me of it was a real indie film where the time just ticks and mm. it's a girl in a cubicle and that's um but I, I I'm sure someone will remember and hopefully tell me one day soon but um I'd started googling girl in cubicle in <laughs> office <laughs> nothing came up anyway um and also uh thank you for putting a bookshop in the book where she she ends up by going to, um, and that was so love, wonderful to be back in a bookshop at a poetry reading. <laughs> I won't give anything yeah. away because it's also a book about the character not, main narrator not being able to write um, because of um, a massive trauma that, that has happened. Um, I'm just going to quickly touch on the toilet scenes because this um, was something that I really 
thought was very interesting as well about her going into the cubicles of the toilets and the silent women that are sat in these cubicles. And I, if anything, I just think this was such a sort of space in the book that was I'd never seen written about before. And if you're anything like myself, I've often sat in these toilets trying to sort of out time the other women mm -hmm. and sort of force, as, as the main character was, force them to almost come out um, be, it, as a sort of strange silent competition of who can be there for longest. But also, yeah, yeah. Did you, how did, did you, did that just come to you in writing or did you actually go and do some sort of method writing <laughs> um, in toilet cubicles? <laughs> I love that as method writing, just like me every day being like, right, what toilet am I going to go and sit in today? Um, I mean, no, but at the same time, so, you know, like of, a lot of about Little Scratch was kind of writing the moments that we would usually instinctively skip in writing. So, you know, the, whether it's kind of like going to the toilet or whether it's just like, oh, I'd rather like get to this point where it's something the climax arrives rather than having to like, push her along 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 to get to it and it was thinking about how those things become interesting by like scrutinizing them um and I did find I did find the space of the toilet really interesting um but also because like when you're in an office and you know for her the the person who is the cause of all of this trauma is somewhere in that office for the whole day um, and so the kind of literal safe space becomes going into a cubicle, closing the door, having this kind of pathetic lock. And, you know, for some reason, this becomes, you know, where you're protected. Um, and so I really wanted to play in that. She, you know, she keeps going back to the toilet. Like, I mean, she, I think, I mean, she must go to that toilet about five times, um, maybe say long, maybe more in the day. Um, and I, I kind of liked how you could get that balance of it. A being a safe space, but B also being like a very comic space because we don't really talk about these kind of weird competitions or um, just kind of like subtle, yeah, power exchanges or just like the kind of English fear of people like witnessing you coming out of a cubicle and analyzing whether you've been like having a poo or not, or you know, just just all these kind of weird things that just happen and that you don't talk about and you leave the you, and I also feel like with our relationship with our colleagues, like if you see them in the toilet, how would you, you engage with them? Because this is a kind of like a personal space suddenly rather than like a formal space. Um so all of these, yeah, like kind of shifts. Um I, I really, I really loved like unpicking. Um but it, yeah, it's, it's just a great, great space for comedy, basically. Mm. Yes. It is, it is very funny. I think you called it um, synchronized shitting and yeah. at one point, but there's, um, let's, let's move away from the toilets <laughs> and um, because there's so much more uh, to, but it is these, this examination of places and things, which um, is very unique, I think, to your book. And so I was wondering, would you mind uh, reading us an excerpt and perhaps introducing it if it, if it needs introducing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I will read, um, I think the, the first thing that I wrote of um, the book. Um, so it is during her lunch break um, and she's just gone and got some soup from the canteen. Um, and she's kind of walking back to find the kind of usual space that she likes to sit and eat her soup. Um, but various things become an unnecessary stress or uh, antagonism. I must walk as if I am not checking whether sofa and table are free. I have no purpose, nonchalantly wandering with my soup that is not too hot, and my spoon that is just in my hand for whenever I fancy using it, purely making a casual parade of the office, bearing to the left towards the kitchen area where a certain sofa resides, not that I'm hoping to get that exact sofa and table I use most days, just after the fridge, hidden behind the coffee station and which may or may not be occupied. No, no, just walking. Just scheming at how, if someone has their Tupperware firmly on the table, how I can walk, not dejected, not me, as if I'm only passing by, not turning around, approaching now, scanning for a foot sticking out, a coat draped on the side. 
I will keep walking, I decide, walking, and just go out the other door as if this was only ever an intended freeway. But, ah, free. Soup quickly down, hands now free, seared pink, popped spoon, just so in front, laid out precise, just so, just knocked off centre by my colleague walking past, not boss, not literally knocked off centre, mind you, the spoon is still there, soup too, but he has interrupted the process. Eye contact already made, him, mouth open. Hello, haven't seen much of you, it's been a while. What have you read recently? Mind gone. Not a clear head, but a blank head, making me question my capacity to think at all. Even though I know that questioning my capacity to think is thinking in itself, but a different sort and not a sort I'm interested in much. I know I was reading a book on the train this morning and yet here I am searching desperately for any hint of a book I might have encountered. What have I read? I say pensively, as if the choice is just too extravagant. And I merely want to select the right book for my shelf that will interest him, the shelf inside my head, I mean, so that I'm not just delivering any old thing, which will only make things worse, naturally, because my head is still blank and time for rumination is running out, only implying I'm thinking over what I say, so that now whatever I say should seem more intelligent. But I still see clearly the table in front of me, my legs underneath asking to be scratched, spoon still clean, Phone flashing WhatsApp, screen unbroken chats, hiding the carefully chosen background of my phone. And I see him noticing too, looking without wanting to at my phone, flickering him to the phone and then to me, to the phone, me too, to the phone, to him, him to me, phone, me, me, him. And I now can't turn the phone over, letting the back face up, because he'll know that I know and that we both know. So I let it flicker. Whilst I continue to think, still not in my head, seeing clearly what is in front and overhead, him standing, jutting out, signalling to those walking, light bulb blinking, but the nook behind the coffee station is in use. Signalling to those passing by, look in, look at the reddening girl sitting on the sofa, mouth shut. Still me, looking out, locking eyes with the him who is now cocking his head, unimpressed. Am I applying that to his face or is he unimpressed? But now I see white, blue lettering, an image, not my spoon and not my phone, although I can see that too, an emoji of a pig, which distracts me for a second, but I'm not letting this go. Yes, an image, a book, yes, blue lettering. That's it, you're doing good, it's what I read last week. That will do, he doesn't know the order of what I read things. Hard castle, no, look, let's grab the title, you've got that me. Well, I guess it's funny how you can so easily forget what you've read recently, but I, yes, yes, it's a coming, read the second body? That's something, not what I'd like to pick out for him. Have you heard of it? Quite interesting. To millennial, it won't please him, but it's a book. He'll know I'm reading and engaging. It looks at butchers and meat and our existence on this planet. He's not interested. I can see him glossing over, and I realise as he says, oh nice, must check it out. But it was only ever a polite question. I could have said anything. Well, not anything. If I had said Cloud Atlas, perhaps he might have bring, wrinkled the bridge of his nose, but really, I could have gone with anything. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. It's a, a great... Um... Uh, yes, something I recognise greatly. It, it does obviously capture one of those moments um, where you're sort of, dis sort of not only despairing of oneself, but there's something else going on with the main character that is just so, it's sort of threaded in with the, the, um, the trauma that she's experienced, that it, it seeps out in little sort of spurts. Mm. Um, and you can I could just hear it there I could just you know a couple of words and and then it's off back into the day and this 
uh, it's it's very cleverly done so well done well done thank, <laughs> thank you thank you for reading <laughs> and we'll talk more about it in a moment um i'm just going to move on to una if you don't mind and then we'll bring it back because i think there's certain crossovers with your book they're very different books but at the at, it, lurking behind in both books there are um uh elements of trauma um, that we could perhaps discuss. Um, but I'm going to now um, talk to you, Una. Um, <laughs> I uh, really loved um, the narrator Libby um, and the depiction of her friendship with Sage as well. Um, the first person narrator worked so well um, in the in the way in which she was sort of unreliable, but also blinkered, um, and I thought it was it was it was really rich um, in her in her age and um, life. Um, also, it's set in um, a, a part of um, America which I hadn't really um, I didn't feel was that had been written about that that much in the sense that it was based on a mountain. Um, and the mountain is ever present. And that I never thought of a mountain and wood and that kind of aspect, all right, the woodland, but it's sort of feeling like this sort of ever present, steady mood in the book, um, which I thought was was really great. Um, and it, it sort of gives a remoteness to the novel where where the past sort of pasts along shadow. And I really felt this. Um, and also I found the depiction of the mother fascinating and so delicately written. Um, so how, going back to the setting, how did you realize the setting and the place? And also, it was, was this a place that was familiar to you or is it, a, is it a, an area that you kind of patch, a bit of patchwork? Um, it, it's Valley, Valley Forge Mountain is a place I, I grew up there. So I, I said it initially, I, I thought about kind of creating a non-place, like a, a, a kind of remote suburb. Um, and the more I thought about this place, it's a Western suburb of Philadelphia. So it's a mountain, but it's really more a hill than a mountain and a suburb is, is there. Um, so it really is kind of suburban early 1980s. But it's an interesting neighborhood because it's um, surrounded by a national park and a protected trail called the Horseshoe Trail that runs behind Libby's house all the way to the Appalachian Trail. And so there's this kind of um, really, in a way, this incredible geography all around her and trees and a, a, a trail. And so initially, when I was sort of trying to scrub the reference of place, the more I thought about this particular place, I, I wanted to set it there because I, I think as well, it's, it, the, you know, the, George Washington spent a winter, at, you know, in Valley Forge. And so there's all this revolutionary history and log cabins scattered around the, the landscape. And there's that history. But then there's also, um, there's, there were quartzite mines on the mountain. Um, so there's these old quarries and, and there's also an Nike site, which was a nuclear anti-missile missile site. Um, so in the early 80s, we were all kind of like, you know, it's what's, you know, are we going to get hit because we're we're on the radar and Reagan had just become president, Thatcher had just become, you know, prime minister. So there was this kind of like this new era and a loss of innocence as well. And I feel like the place suddenly began to uh, trigger a lot of that. And it was in the Western suburbs a lot of farmland, but all of that was starting to come under development. A nuclear power station was being built next to them so they could mm. see the cooling towers from the mountain. And so that, all of those elements, I just felt like rather than scrubbing the reference, maybe I'll hyper use them. And, and that's what I did. Yeah, I think, well, it, it's really, um, it, and the book ends in 1981, doesn't it? I think. Um, but it, it, it's, it begins, it's the summer of 1981. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, so writing about that time, because the, the Manson murders are mentioned, and there's a lot of, for Libby and her, her sisters and um, brother, 
um, and friends, there is there is an element of fear in the air, um, and I think political, you know, around that time anyway. So I, I, yeah, I, um, and it's a coming of age story, and so how did you sort of, I suppose as a writer, how did you sort of access that that youth, uh, you know, that that kind of age uh, of you know, transitioning from being quite young to actually then developing and 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 experience and sort of waking up to the world. I was just interested in that. How yeah. you got to that? I I um I knew that the voice was going to be um the you know the this fifteen year old girl um, would be the narrator, and I did try out a few things at the start and kind of went back to a first person narration she's i mean she's she they've had you know their father has died, the mother's completely emotionally distant and unavailable to them there's five kids and there's a kind of pact you know of a code amongst them of they kind of get on with it and have in some ways have usurped the role of the mother the mother has become in a way has been made herself obsolete because she's absent from them and her life is full of secrets. And they're, you know, processing the grief over their father's death. The father was estranged from the mother and died alone. And they're trying to, I suppose, carry that. And then there's the thing about the friendships, you know, because um, I think a lot of us as particularly female teenage friendships are so intense, you know, it's like, I had more best friends than boyfriends and I can't remember the boyfriends, but the best friends are part of me and have always been part of me. And, and that, that intensity, I just wanted to go there. So she's old enough to understand things and is, you know, she's out drinking and smoking and doing all the things that teenagers did. I, I still do. I have teenagers, but <laughs> they've been caught a few times, but, but the, the, but I also wanted her to not quite grasp things so that the part of this, that summer of 1981 is beginning to um, ultimately maybe piece together some things that she doesn't understand, but, but really to realize that, yeah, the adults fail them, but they're trying their best. And, and I suppose to find empathy at, at some level. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a really interesting take on, um on how how she comes to to not realize the failings of adults and yeah it's beautifully done would you mind reading us a section please yeah so if it's okay i might i had actually i'm going to do two little little sections each is just over a minute or something if that's if that's okay so the first bit i'm going to read is just from the very start of the novel they're driving home and it's the opening sequence and Um, This was sort of, it comes sort of the catalyst moment. Uh, They're driving, there's five kids in the car, the the mother's the driver and um, the kids are fighting in the car and the mother pulls in. The the car skidded into the shoulder right where 252 crossed the turnpike. Out, get out. My mom said it with her voice low, which let us know she meant it. Ellen reached across Thomas, opened the back door and started to climb out. You can't leave her here, Marie said. She started to gather her bag from the floor of the front. Ellen was standing on the gravel verge of the overpass in her school pinafore, tennis shirt, and knee socks. Marie was opening her door when my mother threw the car into gear and accelerated forward. I looked back. Ellen was facing away from us, looking down over the bridge where columns of cars funneled along the turnpike. We sped up 252 into the National Park and then turned west toward Valley Forge Mountain. Ahead of us, the sun had fallen below the fields. We were still five or six miles from home. We careened down the road, went through the covered bridge, past farmland and fences. Beside us, the shadows of dogwoods blurred in the dark as my mother kept driving. Each tree hemmed in a halo of white where the bracts had fallen. So they, they leave the child on the road and the other kids look back and sort of sense that something terrible will happen, which it does. Um, so I'm gonna read from a moment later, um, later in the book. Um, and the kids, a lot of the book, I mean, 
one of the challenges, I suppose, is we're always told like dramatize the moment. I'm listening to Rebecca read and, and every second of the day being dramatized. And and I did the thing of doing flashbacks or, or moments going back into the past, which, um, but but as you said, there is a kind of shadow of, of the past and that was how I, I, I dealt with it. But um, so this is, they grew up landscape, their father cut grass, he was a landscaper and the kids growing up before he died and before he left them, um, they, they'd go out working with him from a very young age, cutting grass or looking after people's gardens. I remember the day at the Cat Ladies when we were working with my dad, she lived alone in an old Victorian style house with at least 40 cats. My dad had looked after her garden for over 15 years since before I was born. She'd been trying to sell the house for a long time and a few summers ago, it had finally sold, even with all the cats hanging around, lying on counters and sitting in sinks. When she was moving, she hired my father to do some work inside, pulling up carpets and taking old furniture to the dump. Marie, Thomas and I all went to help with the job. It was late July and hot, well into the 90s. We'd peeked through her windows before to look at the cats, but had never been inside. The heat and stench were stifling. The ammonia from the cat pee burned our eyes. We choked and the air squeezed out of my lungs. It was a three-story house and the cats had been everywhere. To make it worse, she turned off the air conditioning. The mean bitch, Marie muttered. We started on the third floor where it was hottest and tried to pull out the small carpet nails at the edges. Dad told us to go back to the truck and get gloves. The fumes were in my mouth and throat. When we rolled up the first carpet, which was damp, the floorboards were rotten underneath. Get out of the house and wash your hands and faces at the spigot. Get the soap in the truck, Dad told us. Thomas, you stay with me. He said that the odor would never come out. The new owners would have to take up the floorboards. Marie and I sat outside for hours saying very little when Dad and Thomas finished the work alone, carrying rolled up rotten carpets and heaving them into the back of the truck. Thomas worked intently, staggering under the weight and smell, never wanting to let my father down. He was 14. I sat on the curb with Marie and looked over at the garden that my father had planted for the cat lady years earlier. That year's tomatoes were ripe and red on their vines against her deck. Dad had cane supporting them with soft strings so as not to damage the tender stalks. The cat lady had a Venus de Milo statue in the garden, a naked woman about as high as my hip with missing arms. Marie walked over and kicked her to the ground and came back and sat next to me on the curb. Her face was dirty and streaked. Fucking people think they know something about culture, she said. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. Yes, the book starts in such a tense way and it sort of subverts where you think it's going to go. Um, I, well, I won't give you much away. I don't, never not quite sure how much I can give away. Um, but yes, it's uh, Libby, it's palpable how much Libby wants to make the past okay and to bring it back almost and fix it, um, especially because of her father being gone. And in Re Rebecca, in your story, the past is ever present and just, you know, literally scratching, being scratched at the surface, you know, on the surface of the skin. Um, and both books deal in, in trauma um, or sexual and also a sort of uh well uh, it's difficult to talk about isn't it because it, <laughs> you never quite know how um what to give away and what not so maybe you could talk I, i'm not going to talk about it um i was thinking rebecca about michaela cole's um i may destroy you your book seems to be um a literary kind of adding to that that debate in a way um i don't know how you feel about being likened to to that um but yeah. uh, maybe we could just talk about the subject of of trauma and mm -hmm. rape and you know what what the books deal with yeah yeah um i mean i i always love comparisons because it's a brilliant tv series um so keep it up uh, <laughs> but um i think i think it's a fit, i think it's fitting comparison in terms of um i think both are very aware of how complicated the subject is and are very resistant to a kind of clear or or kind of 
I don't know, maybe a too too short or um, certain narrative, um, um, and both kind of resist statements. Also, both resist, I think, um, two simple ideas of like good and bad. Um, but, you know, I think in Little Scratch, I didn't really want. I wanted I wanted like the protagonist to have flaws and blind spots um, and to not be this kind of uh, angelic victim um, because I think we're very I think there are very tedious tropes around um, victimhood and and also you know uh, I guess similarly actually um, the protagonist of my book wants to be wants to be sexualized and wants to like have you know positive sex and enjoy sex and think about sex um, and for those two spaces to exist separately um, and I think yeah a, a lot of I think when Michaela Cole's um, series came out I think people were very excited um, at how those two spaces overlapped um, and were, were able to be in conversation with each other. Mm. Yeah definitely and you know in, in a way your book um, deals with the ever-present kind of <sighs> sort of danger of men lurking uh, and uh, things that have happened and uh, there being this fear um, often that it's not all about that but there is a lot of um, this feeling that there's there's just something to the side that they're having to be wary of and I think that really in I was thinking about a lot of your uh, prose Rebecca deals with this idea of being watched even though they are not being watched um, but eyes that are formed within us as girls because of things that happen to us uh, or being watched from a young age. And um, it, it, it really made me wonder that, because um, both books do question how different women might be if we just formed and grew up with our bodies and ideas of ourselves without a sort of constant watching um or sort of sense of, of being mauled uh, or in one way or another um and uh, sort of reminded me of that sort of john berger i don't know if you the john berger quote about men watching and women watching themselves being watched and i just wondered if you had any ideas how there might be a way to just keep inside ourselves um <laughs> without this uh, this double gaze do you think we'd have to eradicate men to <laughs> or is that even do you think you know it's a big question I know but it just that's what it got both of your books got me thinking about uh, big questions like those so um, sorry to spring that on you <laughs> I, mean, I think it's I think it's really interesting I, I mean I do think we internalize you know that the subjugating gaze or you know the things that John Berger talks about and I think that's that's quite real I know in in you know and with not not even intentionally I realized that Libby is afraid of intimacy um, she has had um, a kind of intrusive experience um, you know with with a uh, school, schoolmate's father and you know that she tells no one about and because that's you know I think that is you know she freezes in that moment and she's she's not able to act and and this becomes this whole thing of how can to act you know and I sometimes worry that I might have overwritten the moment where she acts acts because to compensate you know to compensate somehow but I do think um you know and, and now we like live in a contemporary moment you know where there's just like um, like I have a son and I have, I have teenage children and, you know, I think about their experience of, of, of their sexuality and who they are coming, coming of age. And I, I often feel a lot of hope for the younger generation. I just think that there's a different, um, my daughters are pretty, pretty comfortable about their bodies. They've taught me to stop shaming them like, like about, you know, the, the, this, the ways I would have looked at them. Sometimes it, you can't leave the house and that, and they're like, oh yes, I can, because like, and so I've learned a lot. I feel a little th that, that younger people are, they have a discourse around it. Mm -hmm. They understand it. My son 
you know, talks about it as well. Like, you know, and I, I listen to this language and I think it's kind of amazing that maybe this younger generation, despite, you know, the, the availability of pornography and whatever, and all the things that we worry about, like that there's something else. And maybe Rebecca is better, you know, because she is a younger generation that you might have a sense of what I'm talking about. <laughs> being idealistic. No, well, I mean, yeah, like, so I'm, I'm 25. So, and I feel like um, my generation is still, is still part of kind of old hangups um, and those kind of issues. But I witness teenagers, I view various connections on those teenagers. And I see, I recognize that as well. You see the kind of the real like literacy around like how to talk about um, prejudice and you know that kind of female lens and bias lenses and stuff like that I mean it's, it's a kind of an amazing consciousness of it um and yeah it's, it's always hard to know how how widely you can apply that whether that whether that's a kind of generational change or whether you're kind of speaking to people who are fortunately seeing it in the right way but either way like there does seem to be far more far more awareness um I, I feel like um there's always gonna, as like being an individual in a world of individuals, like even if you're not, even if there isn't a kind of antagonistic uh, sexist lens, there's still gonna be like a kind of comparative lens. There's still gonna be a kind of placing yourself against other people. And I think that you're, you know, the kind of idealized um, way of of seeing and, and perceiving other people um, is Probably not something we're ever going to reach, but it does. It does feel like there's a kind of discussion and a movement towards something that's more more open. Well, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, fingers crossed. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I'm just I'm aware of the time. We, I, there's so much. Honestly, I think I could continue all evening and bring my wine bottle in and and sit here with you. But I'm aware of your <laughs> your your time. Um, so I, I would just like to ask you um, about um, if you have, first of all, the if you had a book um, that really informed and made you want to write, um, what is that? Is there a book that, um, yes, is there a book that you would particularly press into someone's hand and say you must read this or the that started your your writing career off um is there is there a particular book that you can think of um i would probably say virginia wolves between the acts um which i read at a very kind of formative age um so i think any book you read at that like i don't know it was like kind of 15 or 16 so obviously instantly it's like this kind of mind-blowing thing um but i think when i look back now at that book which i've read quite a few times and the way it kind of considers everyday and ordinary experience and kind of transposes that into something far more like loaded and um yeah I think I think I can kind of see the way in which that's informed how I write without meaning to um mm. which is a kind of a cool thing to be able to retrospectively notice yeah wonderful and yourself or Una? yeah I think uh, probably um may maybe um, Mary Carr's um, Liars Club. I don't know if you read, if you're familiar with that. It's a memoir from the 1990s, and she's she's a writer from West Texas. And um, it it there was something about the honesty and the truth of the book and the comedy um, of of her unusual childhood. And for some reason, that that book and maybe Lori Moore's Who Will Run the Frog Hospital. That those two books. Are books I read in the mid '90s that I think are I'm always distilling in some way. Um, Laurie Moore writes about the intensity of female friendships in that book, and mm. I and and the loss of that. You know that you know it's kind of an elegy for that because nothing ever quite matched it again. And I I think that book. I I the Frog Hospital by Laurie Moore is one of my. The books I recommend to all the people that do my writing course simply I mean I remember her saying in an interview that she couldn't she got so enmeshed in this female relationship 
she actually couldn't wait to stop writing it because it was like she was hanging out with these teenagers who were driving her insane. But it's so intense, isn't it? And it's it's as compact as um, any short story. But yeah, it's it's quite perfect, I think. Um, so um, do you have if if have you got a piece of writing advice that has stuck with you? Um, that you would like to share? Because I know we'll have some, some writers watching that might be feeling like, oh, you know, need a bit of a kick up something. <laughs> Don't know why I'm saying that. It's just winter, isn't it? Um, <laughs> um, has anyone ever said anything to you that you just treasured and carried around? And I heard someone say something to, to another group of students and it's always uh, one of my it's, uh, this man I work with was was it wasn't he wasn't talking to writers but I'm going to apply it to writing, and he and he said give me your ugly writing, you know and that always stuck with me like just write, actually, and once you have something on the page then you have something to work with. Um, and his point to the students was just give me your ugly writing, you know I'll give you feedback but like but write, and I think it kind of it picks up on like Anne Lamott and Bird by Bird, you know just that that. There, there you do have to kind of get over yourself and and just write and and stop the inner police and all of that so that would be i that give me your ugly writing or you know to give yourself <laughs> just get get it on the page yeah i suppose yeah. that's that's about being vulnerable isn't it like allowing yourself to feel vulnerable um i think is a big ask isn't it but thank you for that give me your ugly writing write that on the wall um, <laughs> Rebecca yeah I mean I feel like my that's kind of similar to how I feel which is the kind of sense of like just just like write before you have time to consider why you're writing like I think often there's a, there's too much kind of delay and hesitation and like often that doesn't actually give you anything other than making it harder to get around to writing um so I think it's kind of speed and then distance so like get writing then once you've written step back, leave it, and then come back to it when you're, you're able to look at it as something foreign. Brilliant. Excellent advice. Let it, let it brew. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, um, I think I've had a, I've had a message from a crow um, saying that um, time is nearly up. I can't believe it, but it's flown by. Sorry, excuse the pun, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just, um, it's been so wonderful talking to you both and thank you um, for doing this for, and uh, we're very pleased to, to be collaborating with Faber. Um, these are the books and, you've, and I've been really excited to have various um, men in helmets arrive with uh, bringing your, um, <laughs> both, of, both of your uh, signed book plates. So um, we have those now um, for the books that people will all buy from us now. And thank you for doing that. Um, especially there is a special one, Rebecca, that you've done with a picture of a crow. And that's going to be the, the, per the, the first person <laughs> to buy the book after this Aww. film will get the special crow drawing. So. Anyway, thank you for doing that. I think I think you you are you, you sort of get, you know, unfortunately you couldn't be at the shop to get the sense of who we are, but hopefully you get a sense of, of the sort of indie nature of who we are. But um thank you both very much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. And good luck. Fun. You're welcome. Good luck with everything. Bye. Bye, Karen. Bye, Rebecca. Bye bye. They can find you book for your girlfriend, your husband, your girl, or your boy. And if you've got an E for an uplifting meet, Justine and Jonathan can pick out a book you'll enjoy. What a book at the bookseller Crow on the Hill. What a book, what a book at the bookseller Crow on the Hill. Crystal Palace Hill, Ed. But you can order online.